Hey all you Firebase developers, welcome to another episode of Ask Firebase, the show where we answer your burning Firebase questions. So today I am joined by Abe Haskins and Abe is a developer programs engineer. What does that mean? Basically it means that I do programming related to helping people use Firebase. Well, perfect. Uh, I got some questions together that we can take a look at and maybe yeah. answer together if you want to do that. Absolutely. So our first question comes to us from Twitter, from Evander Berg. And the question is, if I use the get function in a Cloud Firestore security rule to retrieve a document to validate against, does this count towards my Firestore read operations or any other quotas? Yep. So first off, anything related to pricing, always check out our pricing page. We have a very detailed description of how every like possible operation impacts what you will be paying. So this does change. So you know what I'm saying here applies today, but always check that oh, for the source of truth point. for anything related yeah. to pricing. Uh, right now, the way it works is that if you read from Firestore from anywhere, it counts as a read operation. So that get is a read operation. What it doesn't count as though is any network bandwidth. It's not outgoing, it's not incoming, it's happening within our infrastructure. So it is a read operation, but it's not uh, outgoing request or incoming request. So it's a little cheaper, but it is still a read operation against Firestore. Okay, well, that's good to know um, because I saw that question and I was like, yeah, that's actually very valid. Um, <laughs> and uh, we'll also link to anything pricing related. We'll, we'll link to that pricing part because probably uh, users have a lot of different questions related yeah. to pricing. Yeah, and we put a ton of effort into describing the Firestore pricing in the most reasonable way. So that document is really good at answering all sorts of pricing related questions. Sweet, thank you. Let's hit another one, shall we? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you're just laughing at how I have to keep reading uh, yeah, the names. The, you're the, like, the names oh, how's she going to do this one now? <laughs> Achi2 asks, is there anything special to watch out for when building PWAs with Firebase? So maybe we should just start with what's a PWA? So a PWA isn't actually anything. It's kind of a group of web standards that if you were building things using these web standards, you're building a PWA. Uh, so people use this to mean a, a few things in general which is that a PWA is a web app that's bundled in a specific way that can be used offline, that can be uh, very fast, preferably faster than a normal web app would be, and it can be installed to the home screen of your device. So there's so a bunch of... So yeah. a progressive web app is supposed to behave as much as possible like a, a native app. Yes, exactly. But instead of being distributed through like the App Store or the Play Store, you go to the website and it says, hey, would you like to add this to your home screen? And when you do, it does some magic and it bundles up that page and shows it like a native app. Now, why might someone want to do that instead of a, a regular web page? Or Well, the big advantage is that it kind of gives you a presence on the user's device. So you can have what feels like a normal app without them having to go hunt it out, because it's very easy to get someone to your website, and then you can easily pop up the dialogue that asks them if they want to add it to the home screen. So you're not going through the whole burden of, install, of saying, go to the Play Store, install this. You can just say, oh, now this web page you're already using, you're already familiar with, is now there. And if they say no, that's fine. They can keep using it as a normal web page, and it's not going to hurt the experience at all. OK. So that being said, um, if I want to use Firebase to make a progressive web app, what do I need to watch out for? Yeah. So there's one big thing that catches everybody in about 10 different ways. And that is that a PWA is really based around this idea of a service worker. And a service worker is a client-side proxy that all of your web requests go through. So when you request that index.html page, it doesn't go straight to the server. It goes to your service worker, and your service worker looks in a cache, and it says, all right, do I have a version of this? And in that service worker, you write just normal JavaScript, but it can influence what's returned from the cache. And the reason you do this is because to get really good offline, you need a ton of control over what gets cached. You want your images to be cached, but not your dynamic API calls and things like that. So if you're using a service worker and you're building it from scratch, by default, when you go and write like the simplest uh, service worker, it caches everything. Mm -hmm. And you're probably just going to like throw it in a cache and retrieve it later. And if you do that, you are going to end up with a bunch of crazy behavior. And this is true not only if you're writing one from scratch, but if you're using like the Angular boilerplate, it by default caches things very aggressively. So that's going to end up with behavior where you deploy to Firebase hosting, and you think, OK, great, my app is there. Oh, you make some change, deploy again. 
you'll go and you'll see the old version of the app because the service worker is sitting there having aggressively cached everything and you're gonna be like, why is this not here? And if you don't understand all the intricacies of service workers, it's not gonna be clear why. Uh, so with Firebase, that can generally be an issue. But with mm -hmm. Firebase, it's particularly bad because we make a ton of API calls on your behalf. So if your service worker is sitting there caching those API calls, things get really crazy. So for example, it will cache by default the um, read requests from Firebase database. So you can read data from Firebase. It'll cache some of that. And then later, you'll come back, and you'll have new data in your Firebase, and you'll be getting back old data because the service worker is caching that. So you need to be really, really careful about this. And this happens across basically all the Firebase services. Mm -hmm. Everything that uses uh, client-side web requests, which is all of them. Uh, and so you need to go through, and you need to explicitly say, Google APIs should not be cached by your service worker most of the time. Let Firebase do its job, and don't let your service worker start messing up uh, those interactions between our clients and our servers, because for the most part, we've already thought of the offline interactions for our databases and stuff like that. Great. Well, that was really fun. I'm so glad to have you on. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. And remember, if you have any questions, post them on social media, Twitter, Facebook, put them on Stack Overflow with the hashtag as Firebase yeah. in it. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Ha, ha, ha.